في بلدنا سمع صوت الدربكشي والشباب الإب في الإيد نزلت ساحة الدبكي I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming New York's senior Senator Chuck Schumer. Having served in the Senate for the past 15 years, it is clear that Senator Schumer is the senior statesman when it comes to immigration in Congress. He was the architect of several prior congressional attempts to pass immigration reform, including the 2013 Senate bill that was the first in more than a decade to actually pass in any House of Congress and received 68 votes, more than two-thirds of the entire Senate. More recently, Senator Schumer has played a key role in ensuring that Nepali immigrants are able to receive temporary protected status, TPS, which is something that the entire Nepali community is extremely grateful for, and that is an area where the center has shown tremendous leadership. So we are very lucky today to be joined by Senator Chuck Schumer, are we ready for the senator? Thank you, Steve. Great to be here. And you know, there couldn't be a better place for the National Immigration Integration Conference to hold its event than Brooklyn. Now, let me tell you why. Several reasons. First, we are a borough of immigrants. One of the reasons I love Brooklyn is there are so many different groups. In one school, in one public school in Brooklyn, we had 27 different ESL classes because we had so many immigrants from all, every corner of the world. And it's immigrants that have made Brooklyn great. Brooklyn is like a tube. You know, we used to, Coney Island, have these tubes you walk through that spun around. And what happens is people from all over the globe for centuries, ever since, you know who the original and first immigrants were to America? Immig English, the English, because the Dutch had settled in Brooklyn and weren't so sure they wanted to let the English come. And you walk through that tube called Brooklyn, and you walk in citizens of different countries, and you come out Americans. And then your children sally forth around the rest of the country and do great things. And what else do we have in Brooklyn? We have that beautiful lady with the torch. Well, she's in New York City, but we see her from Brooklyn, <laughs> across the water. And what does that torch mean? It means the dream, the American dream. It beckons people from all over the world and says, come here, we want you here. We want you to become Americans. My middle name is Ellis, named for my uncle Ellis after Ellis Island. My daughter's middle name is Emma, named for Emma Lazarus, the woman who wrote the poem on the base of the Statue of Liberty that said, give me your poor and your tired, earning to be free. 
and the reason. So it is great that you have chosen Brooklyn. Because in Brooklyn, and the rest of America ought to, and the rest of America by and large does, but some in America ought to learn the lesson from Brooklyn. We love immigrants. Immigrants are great for our communities and great for America. And let me say, what is so diff one of the biggest differences between America and Europe? Why have we prospered far more than they? Why is there much less dissension in our land than in theirs? Maybe above all, because we welcome immigrants. We don't say, come here and work and then go home, we don't want you. We say, come here and, and work, work hard. And we know it'll be good for you and good for your families, but it will also be good for our country. And then we say, we want you not just to work here, we want you to become citizens here, like everybody else. We don't want something second rate. We don't want you to just, we don't want you just for work. We want you to become full-fledged Americans. And when people, and when people from any country come, they see people from their town, or from their family, or from somewhere else who's been here a generation or two. And they have a nice house. And they have a couple of cars in the garage. And their kids are getting high at advanced degrees. And those people, a generation ago, or two generations ago, were immigrants like the new, newly arrived. And they say, that American dream, that torch, is not just for others, it is for me. That's the beauty of America, ladies and gentlemen. The greatest strength we have, bar none, is that we take people from every different place and welcome them and love them and prize them. So there are some voices right now that are trying to prey on anti-immigration sentiment. Don't let them get you down. We've had this in various times in America, particularly when economic times aren't that good. It happened, there was a whole party. I regret to say it came from New York called the Know Nothing Party in the 1840s, dedicated dedicated to turning away immigrants. Guess where the know nothing, guess where the know nothings are now? Nowhere. Nowhere. <laughs> guess where those who are anti-immigration now will be in a few years? Nowhere. And the voice of the mainstream of America, the voice of the mainstream of America, which knows how good immigrants are for America, from every region, from every color, from every creed, from every religion, from every economic level, will, I assure you, prevail. And, one of the vo and that voice is gonna help us. I, I, I as, as, as Steve mentioned, am so proud to be the co-author, along with John McCain, a Democrat and a Republican, of comprehensive immigration reform. And, I want to make a prediction. The anti-immigrant sentiment that is in, I'm not going to be partisan except a little, <laughs> that is in the other party today will not only, is not only wrong morally and ethically and spiritually and American-wise, it's wrong politically. It's a bad move politically. And they will lose the election and there will, and then, in 2017, one of the first things, as far as best I can see to it, and I'm slated to become the Democratic leader, one of the very first things we will do is put comprehensive immigration on the floor of the Senate. It'll get to the floor of the House. It'll get to the President's desk. And we will have comprehensive immigration reform and make America whole once again. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless our immigrants here in America. Um, our goal for this plenary is to look beyond 
policy and to look beyond immigration integration issues to encourage the participants here to consider how the work they do as immigrants and or with immigrant communities is impacted in a broader context that includes arts, culture, and media. We tend to work in very siloed fields, and yet the reality is that culture, media, and the arts really inform us all and create a public imagination and also a space to speak out. So we're gonna start right now with a clip. We're gonna show clips of each of our speakers. And so first, we'll start with Jose Diaz Ballard. Um, we'd like to really know how you insert that human element to your stories and how, looking at this work as a journalist and the whole issue of objectivity, when you feel you can and should really speak out as an advocate. Well, thank you, and, and good afternoon to, to all of you. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, I live this every single day of my life, and I do it in two languages. In the morning, 9 to 11 in the morning, I'm on MSNBC. At 6.30 p.m., I'm on, I'm on Telemundo Network. Uh, and then Sundays and Saturdays on NBC and Telemundo. But every single day, I think, am I doing enough to just let other voices be heard? And I think it comes down to, and something I've tried to do in, in the English language side of my career, is it's very easy for the media in any language, but especially in English language, to think of our communities when it's obvious that our communities are involved. And it's almost stereotypically obvious. So, uh, you know, Syrian refugees, let's talk to you. Uh, you know, should we do the Muslim thing? Let's talk to you. Uh, immigration, let's talk to you or you. But I, every single day think, well, I'm gonna do a story on comedians. Well, they're funny Muslims. And let's have you on as a funny person, not as a funny Muslim. And let's have a lawyer who happens to maybe look like you to talk about legal reform of, I don't know, something that's not related to your religion. That's the difficulty I see. And that's what I think of every single day. Because there are funny Muslims and unfunny Muslims. There are funny Christians and unfunny Christians. I've seen a lot of them recently. <laughs> there are lawyers that happen to be Muslim, Jewish, Latino. And it's about representing who our communities and what this country is when it's not an obvious subject. But then, when it is a subject that touches our medulla, that which is our most personal, important thing in life, then it's important that we have voices that aren't the experts in New York or Washington, D.C., who can come and give a great speech, some with prompter and some without. It's also about the people who every single day live it and who know in their heart and in their soul what it means to talk about issues like this. And that's why that girl whose father and mother were in the one deported and one about to be deported, that to me is as, is as an important interview as any president, senator, or member of Congress. Because those are the people that know and live it. And that's why I have to tell each and one each and every one of you, and I see Frank Sherry, and I see Ben Monterroso, and I see uh, Gustavo Torres, and I see so many friends that I see on a daily basis and speak to. It is upon you to continue to stand up, insist and demand, but also work with those who maybe disagree with us to say, we're not going anywhere. Every month in this country, 53,000 Latinos born in the United States turn 18 years of age. And when candidates say, Latinos are gonna vote for me because the ones that can't vote are the illegals, they're not gonna vote anyway, let's set them straight. So, we really wanna thank you for how you've included those voices from the ground, from organizers on the ground, from artists, etc. But also the way you've used your own voice, because you and Jorge Ramos, 
actually, you know, speaking up to Donald Trump. I mean, Trump snapped this summer when you asked for that apology around how he had besmirched Latinos. So can you talk to us about how you approach keeping our presidential candidates accountable and also, you know, address this incredible shift that we've had to public incivility and a real discourse of um, fear yeah. prevailing. Look, I, you know, Jorge is one of my, Jorge Ramos, the anchor of Univision, is one of my dear friends. I admire him. We've been working in television for 30 plus years. Um, I remind him he looks older than me uh, every single day. Uh, but uh, it, for me, it's not about being an activist. It's just about giving people the opportunity to speak. It's not about what I think about or what I care about. It's about giving the opportunity for people of different perspectives, of different thoughts, of different um, even ideological persuasions to speak. It's not about the television person's opinion. If it were, you know, there, there are a lot of networks that do that. You can, you can get your opinion reaffirmed in any number of different ways shouldn't be the news de departments telling you what you want to hear. It should be giving voice to all sides. And there are people here, look, there's Adrián Carraquillo of BuzzFeed is a young Latino who uh, is on the forefront, I think, of a new journalism, but with the principles and, and standards of that which make me very proud. And it's about giving others voices and not putting your opinion in as the important one, because back to the voices. It's not about me. It's about the voices of the people who every single day live with the realities of what political decisions are taken in Washington, how it affects them. Thank you, Jose. And we know that you, with your incredible schedule of being on two different stations in Spanish and English, have a story you have to go cover. I do indeed. Um, I'm so, so sorry. When you have to bow out, please just I know do. I thank you. We, we so appreciated your presence. We're going to move on now. So we're living in a time when changing demographics make a lot of the language that we have accepted, um, like mainstream or underrepresented, you know, these terms have really become inverted or have been given new meaning. Or we have these kind of oxymoronic terms like majority, minority that kind of don't even make sense. Um, and, you know, I, I'm looking at the fact that even in the press now, the need for new language, I don't know if you saw in the Washington Post, uh, the article about the lack of black faculty on college campuses, and they talked about HSBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, but also about TWIs, traditionally white institutions. It was the first time I'd seen that in print. I thought it was amazing. So talk to us about why race forward engage with this issue of shifting language. And clearly we've seen some of the impact of that. The reason that we picked up the Drop the I Word campaign in 2010 to begin with was there were really two reasons. One was that we could see the effect that the word had on our own people, on immigrants and on people of color, not just um, immigrants of color, but other people of color who may not have been immigrants at all. I remember this um, young man coming up, up to me after I'd done a book talk on the accidental American years ago in Portland, Oregon. Uh, he'd been circling our talk during it, and at the end he came up to me and in a whisper said, I, I, I overheard you talking about immigration and I wanted to ask you this question. and it really, in the tiniest whisper, he said, I'm illegal, he whispered it. And he wanted me to tell him if there was anything he could do. He said, do you think I should? Uh, he was a dreamer. He'd been uh, brought by his parents to the country when he was two years old and got out of high school, wanted to be an architect. He was looking at the art and architecture books during this talk. Uh, but now he found he couldn't go to college, he couldn't get a job, he couldn't do anything. And he wanted to know, do you think I should turn myself into the state and beg for mercy? This was in 2008. And I had to tell him, no, I don't think you should do that. Um, I think you should join a group and fight. The thing about language is that it's so often about characterizing our people and what role we play in the national story. The year after we started the Drop the I Word campaign, we released a research report and broke a story about how 
deported immigrants end up losing their kids permanently and legally through the child welfare system. At the time, we estimated that 5,000 kids are sitting in foster care now because their parents have been deported, not because there has been any kind of abuse or neglect or trouble in the family. So not having papers should not be something that gets your kids taken away from you and made eligible for adoption, but because the, in part because the I word had been so active and so prevalent, um, had not having papers became that reason, became a reason to have your kids taken away from you. So in our study, we found judges, for example, who equated being deported with abandonment. So they said, this parent is, is okay, they're not here, they've abandoned the kid. Uh, they, judges who said, well, this kid is a US citizen, we couldn't possibly send him to the very dangerous uh, third world place where his parents are now living. Uh, judges who said, we can't place this child with another family member because that family member is quote unquote illegal. So these, uh, the language that we use and the decisions that we make individually, family court judges, social workers, uh, police officers, and the decisions we make collectively uh, by passing a piece of policy, those two things are very, very closely related. And in, when we think about communications pol uh, strategy at Race Forward, we think about it in three parts. Part one is the frame, your worldview. Part two is the narratives. Those are the stories that illustrate your worldview. And part three is the message, which is the action that you want taken now. And in Drop the I Word, we were trying to change the frame on immigration from purely law and order to a human dignity frame. We were trying to change all the stories that were getting told from being stories of people, uh, quote unquote, breaking the law, including many that were just lies, stories that were just made up, to stories of people being harmed by the racial bias that the word had come to uh, represent. And the action from being only use the I Word to use alternatives. And what we learned from that process is that your narratives, your stories might change based on who you're talking to, and your message might change based on what moment of your campaign you're in, but your frame cannot change. Your frame has to stay consistent. You can't use human dignity over here for one group of people and economic benefit over here for another group of people. That, our frame is what gives us consistency morally and politically. So if we want to change the narrative, the story that the country is telling about immigrants and immigration, we have to be willing to engage that narrative, actually engage the language, engage the stories. And we're not gonna be able to beat you know, a third of our uh, fellow citizens and residents into submission by just throwing a bunch of data at them. We have to actually think about the language that we're using and think about the stories that we're telling and make sure that those are all uh, coming together in the interest of human rights and uh, racial liberation and racial justice. Thanks. Thank you for placing that at the intersection of racial justice and immigrant justice. Um, we're going to now look at a clip from Linda Sarsour. She's the executive director of the Arab American Association of New York. So if we can have that clip, please. Well, um, I really love this clip. When I first saw it, I thought it was incredibly unexpected and courageous to counter Islamophobia using your own story and really as a woman, your own body to tell that story. So thank you for, for the creativity, but the courage also. Um, and I guess I, I wanna ask how you bring in and why you bring in your personal identity and story. Um, and I'm actually, because I'm a theater director and I realize that there's a whole group of people who can't see us. Could you stand um, and talk from the center of the stage? Thank you. Thank you. First of all, welcome to my hometown of Brooklyn. <laughs> I'd say that I have a better, uh, much stronger Brooklyn accent than Senator Schumer. Um, I think uh, Tanu from the New York Immigration Coalition wanted to use that clip and I think it's a very important one and one of the reasons is is I use my identity as a Palestinian woman, as a Muslim, as a parent, 
as someone that does go get manicures, I'm sorry, I have to do that. It's, it's part of my ritual. But also as a person born and raised in Brooklyn, this is, a, this is a story, this is my story. And I think what I've been trying to do, and I've very, worked very hard at this, is that I'm tired of people trying to tell my story. I have my own voice. I know my story better than anyone else knows my story. And unfortunately, we live in a time right now where this actually does require courage. And that's unfortunate that it requires courage for women like me to stand up and tell our stories. The media, many media outlets, have basically set out a frame and buzzwords. This is all psychological, right? You hear terrorism, you want to automatically think, God, if they're, if they're talking terrorism, this must be something to do with Muslims. And what we've been trying to do in our community is trying to tell the stories of who Muslims are in America. And the fact that we, many of us in our community are actually not immigrants and are very indigenous to this nation, including to this right here, Brooklyn. The idea that we, our faith has been on the shores of this nation since the days of its founding when we forced black Muslim slaves to come to America. That my faith is so deeply rooted in this nation and that when someone wants to tell me that I need to go back to my country, my country is Brooklyn, New York. The media has been a great opportunity for people like me to go up on national television and not apologize for the very few people that think they're associated with my community and the actions that they make. I use my voice and my voice of courage to push back and say, don't put that on me, just like you don't put other crimes and other acts of terrorism on other people. And that's the kind of message that we've been trying to send on a national level. I'm very proud of this next generation of American Muslims, including my sister here, Nagin, who you'll hear from shortly, who are using courage and truth. And you know what? I always take a risk, sisters and brothers, to be on a national media show and to say, you know what? I'm gonna speak my truth. And the risk is I may never get invited back. But what I found was that I do get invited back again and again and again because I bring a perspective that is not just of American Muslims, but a new generation of Americans that's saying enough is enough. We're not gonna stand for hate and divisiveness in this country. We're gonna be big and bold and say that immigrants belong here, that this country was built on the backs of immigrants and black people, that we're gonna stand on national television and say black lives matter again and again until black lives really matter in this country. And we're gonna do that by telling our own personal stories. When I get on national television, I don't say I represent every Muslim in this country because I don't. There are Muslims that I personally don't agree with and I don't want to represent them. But I can go on national television and say, I'm from Brooklyn. I'm a New Yorker. I went to public school. I'm a mother. And there's going to be someone on that other side of that TV is going to be like, oh, I went, oh, I'm a mom too. I know where she's coming from. Guess what? I went to public school too. Being able to rate, relate to fellow Americans is the way that we've been able to change some of the narrative. But we still got a lot of work to do even when the media is doing the right thing, and I'll give you one quick example. When three beautiful young college students in Chapel Hill were murdered in a hate crime, it was the first opportunity that we were able to really shine light on the issues impacting American Muslims in a way that we haven't done before. But just a couple of weeks before that, a young black Somali Muslim boy, Abdus Samad Sheikh, was also killed in a very clear hate crime in Kansas City. Silence. It took three light-skinned, beautiful Muslims in North Carolina to be killed for someone to start talking about Muslims. So we need to continue to do work in our community to re reflect who our community is. My community looks like me, but my community is also indigenous African Americans, African immigrants, Latino immigrants. Our community reflects every racial, diversity, every ethnic diversity across the world, and it is our stories and our courage and our boldness that's gonna change the narrative. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for the way you're relating to a lot of our struggles. And I'm going to move on to Nagin, and uh, I know, hope, with your apologies. I apologize, I have to go. Uh, I thank you. I want you. you to go cover those stories. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Jose. Yeah, let's shut it down.
Um, and we're going to start with the clip from the trailer from The Muslims Are Coming. So, Nikki, your art form, comedy, has been one of the most effective in terms of changing hearts and minds, and actually even where a lot of younger people get their news from. Um, you know, I was in a public space the other day, was, you know, I always eavesdrop on young people, and they were talking about whether, they were arguing about, are you Team Michael or are you Team Raphael? And those of you who watch Jane the Virgin will know what that means. Um, all right. Uh, but, you know, what I was thinking about is that these young people are also getting this through this sitcom, this incredible narrative of the grandmother who is undocumented. And as a strong woman, the silencing that goes on and the choices she makes. And as we all know, the author Jeff Chang talks about how culture shifts often before policy shifts. So I'd love to hear you talk about this film in particular, the genesis of this project, and how it's being received. Uh, yeah, hi everybody. Um, so, first of all, I'm Team Raphael. Um, and thank you, and I know it's a really, really great position for me to take. Um, and uh, also, this whole event is really ridiculous because this is the kind of event that like 31 GOP governors would say, not in my state. Um, so that's, we're basically that, those people now. Um, uh, so, um, I, so, so the Muslims are coming, you know, it, it, it came out um, on, it, it's available on Netflix. It came out in 2014 on Netflix, um, in early 2014, which means our contract is running out in 26, in a couple of months. Um, and I'll tell you that, uh, that Netflix is not quite interested in renewing our contract. Um, so, so first I have to say to you guys that it's really important for us to like vote with our Netflix dollars um, and to like put the movie on repeat just in the background of whatever the fuck we're doing. Um, because, because it is maybe the only like, m you know, m movie that's portraying Muslims in a positive light available on Netflix. Um, or maybe, you know, available on like, I don't know how many digital platforms, the, the, you know, in terms of a feature film. Um, we don't have that much stuff out there. Uh, like Linda was saying, we don't see ourselves and stuff. And so um, it was really, you know, important uh, for me and, and, and for all the comedians in the movie to be able to like tell our own stories. And so, the, you know, the way the movie has been received has been, you know, some, I get like, you know, emails from 16-year-old girls who are like, I'm Filipino and I live in Iowa and your movie meant something to me, which I didn't, like, which is great because I also feel a little, like, I'm also a 16-year-old Filipino girl in Iowa. You know what I mean? Like, we're all 16-year-old Filipino girls in Iowa. Do you know what I mean? Just the way we're all also, you know, Syrian refugees and whatever, we're rejected. And so, um, and so that has been really lovely to be able to make that connection um, with, with, you know, those people. Also 43 year old like white guys in Canada have also said the same. And I say to them, you are also a 16 year old, uh, a Filipino girl in Iowa. Um, but um, the, other, the other thing that has come out of it is, uh, well, I mean, I get death threats. Hey, uh, buy a round of applause who in here gets death threats, right? Okay, they're fun. And, um, the, the most recent one I got was to my parents' home phone, uh, and uh, they left a voicemail, which I thought was uh, really nice. And um, they, it, but it was really poor. It was like, I'll, you know, if your daughter keeps doing what she does, I'll kill her. I'll kill you all. Uh, which was, it was just sort of cliche. I mean, I feel like if you're gonna leave a death threat, like kind of, you know, there should be some more innovation in that space. Um, <laughs> but um, and, and so, uh, and it's funny to me because. Uh, it, it, at no point did it occur to me that it would be weird or, or that I would get a death threat. You know, I'm five foot four and I look, dress like a cartoon character. So it, why does anyone waste their time? You know what I'm saying? Anyways, um, what is the quote? Okay, let me see if I can. Uh, but I, I do, I will, I, I will say the, the interesting thing about how this movie has come out is that then the fight sort of, you realize, never ends. I'm basically, we're kind of stuck doing this shit, right? Until, until like there's peace on earth, right? That's the weird thing. And so it's like endless. Um, and, and, and one of those 
result is like, you know, there was a bunch of hate campaigns and uh, in a particular hate group that put up a bunch of Muslim posters throughout the New York City subway system and as, as well as um, San Francisco, Philadelphia. And, uh, and they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and that, uh, they were just these ugly, you know, posters about Muslims. And so me and my co-producer, Dino Vidal from the movie, thought, uh, you know, I, I, I called him up and I said, hey, like, if they're gonna do, um, you know, these kind of like anti-Muslim posters, like, why don't we do like a delightful Muslim campaign, we'll promote the movie, it'll be, you know, a fighting bigotry with delightful posters. Uh, we worked with the MTA for five months to do this. Um, they approved all the posters, we were ready to go. Um, on the day they were supposed to go up, they didn't go up. We were like, oh, well, it just takes a while. It's fine, though. Everything's fine. Two days later, we get a call from the lawyers who were unpleasant, and they said, um, you know, we decided that to ban this kind of poster it represents political speech, and we're banning political speech. So we did what any, you know, normal Muslim would do, and we launched the, the Fighting Bigotry with Delightful Lawsuits campaign, and we uh, sued the MTA, um, and because uh, it's So we sued the MTA, and then here's the weird thing, like, uh, we won. So a couple of, <laughs> a couple of dirtbag comedians took on the MTA, and the comedians won. That is, you know what I mean? Uh, and that's why Chuck Schumer warmed up the room for me today. Um, he was my opening act. Uh, but, so, so my point is, however, the, uh, that we, um, that, th that the work sort of never ends and it takes on different dimensions. Um, and uh, I'm gonna, I'll shut up, and that's it. So happy we heard from all of our plenary speakers and we have about 10 minutes left and I wanna open it up to a conversation between you. So what thoughts do you have for each other or questions that you may have for each other? I have a thought, actually. So um, I was saying earlier that um, uh, we, so much of language change is about, it's for us, it's for us to be able to see ourselves differently from the way that we're characterized by the, by the mainstream story. And I think that um, one of the things I learned when I was first learning about shifting stories and narratives is there's this really freaky idea, it's freaky to me, that when, the, when a person is really deeply engaged in a story, like they're watching a movie or they're reading a book and they're really deeply engaged, their brain takes them physiologically through the reactions that the protagonist is having. So like you don't have to sit down and watch Beaches and think, oh, I want to cry, like, Bette Midler, you know, I want to be like Bette Midler, you are just going to cry at the end of Beaches if the story has been told well. And I think that's, um, there's something about getting the body, people's bodies involved. I think that's what's so um, hugely important about what you do, Nagin, because, and Linda, you too, because you make people laugh. And then once we're laughing, our bodies are involved and it's involuntary. The person doesn't have to be like, oh yes, I want to watch this film about these Muslim comics and feel sympathy for them as they try to bring delight around the country and get a bunch of hatred back. They are going to feel that anyway. So to me, that's a huge argument for becoming, for adding great storytelling and great framing to our skill set, to our toolbox. You know, we're, uh, I think a lot of the people in this room, old colleagues of mine, we're organizers, we're researchers, and we're really good with the data, but the data isn't gonna save us here. Uh, what, what is gonna save us is our truth in another form, and that is in the form of our stories, other people's stories, but in the form of stories where there are characters and things happen, there are plots, um, and, and that, uh, because that's gonna, it gives us a new, um, I can't use uh, weapons language, it gives us another tool in our toolkit uh, for <laughs> helping people get to the places we need them to get to, which is seeing immigrants um, as part of the racial justice trajectory of this country and as part of this country. I just wanted to say so many artists know that the people in this room value arts and culture. But I think connecting the dots and also that 
word tool that artists tend to feel sometimes like they're just a tool for a certain agenda. So, you know, how do we get past that in terms of creative strategies? Um, and yeah, well, Jose was kind of talking about that before. Like, uh, I've been on so many of these shows, <laughs> not so brag, um, but like I've been on, you know, like the MSNBCs and CNNs or whatever. Some tragic thing happens, roll the Muslim girl out, like, you know, whatever. If, if, although I'm a comedian, so it's sort of like, why are you rolling me out? I don't know. Anyway, but, um, but, and I always say to them, like, I w was formerly a policy analyst, um, and I am, like, I have a lot of credibility in the campaign finance space. And, um, you know, and I have the degrees and I have all of that stuff, bring me on. I will, you know, talk the pants out of Citizens United, bring me on. And they will, and I, I, I begged, I begged, but nope, they only bring me on when there's a Muslim thing, you know? And so uh, that's part of it is like seeing, Mus you know, uh, uh, one of the things um, uh, th that I did that's gonna, a, a movie you have coming out in April, it's called Third Street Blackout, and it's just a romantic comedy set in the blackout after Hurricane Sandy, and it just so happens to star uh, an Iranian-American Muslim female, which is me, and it's not, and, 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 and you, you know that she's Muslim, you know she's Iranian, you might hear her speak Farsi, but it's not a big deal, it's not the focus of the movie, it's a romantic comedy at the end of the day, and I think we can, we can start sort of, you know, inter, interjecting um, like some brown into these things. I just, I just wanted to, um, to add that sometimes when we think that we're on national media or we're um, you know, doing these videos and trying to put out communications, like thinking about who we're talking to. I'm actually not talking to my opposition, and it may seem like I am. I'm talking to young people. And the reason why I, 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 I see that we have a responsibility, when I see young dreamers that put themselves out there and go on national television or are standing at these big rallies, there are people who watch us in our communities. There are people that we're trying to give courage to, that we're trying to say it's okay to get up and speak out. So when I'm on national television, I want young Muslim women, young immigrant women or children of immigrants to see me and say, hey, if she can do that, I can do that. If she can be up there and proud, if she can speak the truth, I can do that. So the audience that I'm speaking to is a different audience than what people think we're speaking to. I'm not trying to speak to, quote, mainstream America. I am mainstream America. So when, you're, when we're out there, think about who your audience is, right? We make it seem like my mom watches MSNBC too. Like my parents watch CNN. My parents are watching, you know, local news channels. My parents are, are, are on Facebook, right? Like they watch videos on Facebook too. So this idea that when we're on national media that we're trying to convince some other people, yeah, you know what, they might be in the bunch and they might be like, oh, I can understand what she's saying. But really we're talking to our own people. It is our way to get a mass message out to our own people to say, the time is now for us to stand up for our own communities because if we don't stand up for our own communities, no one's gonna stand up for us. And that's why we need to think about the media, not us tools for the media, but the media is my tool, my, my tool to get my message out there to the masses and make sure that at least some of us are out there speaking the truth and at least some of us are humanizing our communities and not making us into dollar signs or other types of more tangible um, benefits. Thank you. So, so on that note of I am Mainstream America, um, we want to thank all of our plenary speakers today. We want to encourage you to attend the arts and culture track. You can connect with more artists, organizers, more media people, more cultural organizers. Again, thank you so much to Nick, Culture Strike, and our guests.